we're down here in the greenhouse today. We've got some more seeds to sow. And perhaps we're going to do a little bit of myth busting because we've got something interesting to discuss. And I think that's the format these videos are going to take when we're doing the seeds down here in the greenhouse. We're going to sow the seeds and we're going to have a bit of a natter about some things. And today we're going to try and bust a bit of a myth about food miles. So watch out for that one coming when we're sowing the seed. Speaking of which, let me get things switched up around about here. We'll get the cameras all set up and we'll get some seeds sown. So first things first, what have we got on the go today? We've got a couple of favourites. First one here, Kohlrabi, and this one is Cossack F1. Green variety, marvellous, doesn't go all tough and chewy and muddy when it gets too big. Brilliant variety. And my favourite pepper, the, the, the king of the peppers, king of the north, and apologies for the packet being upside down there, but obviously you open at the bottom. I opened these before we did the video, so they were ready to go. King of the north done, brilliant video recommended to us by you guys and Kate a while ago. Absolutely marvellous. And the other one here is a new one and it's called Sweet Tangerine Dream. Let me show you that there. There we go. So for putting them in, just the standard sort of pot and mix I use here. One thing that I do see quite a lot asked is what is the percentage of perlite that I use in my pot and mix? So I use a specific pot and compost. So I use the Melcourt Silver Grow, which is absolutely marvellous. And then I add perlite to it pretty much all the time. And it's about 30% perlite, I would say. I am by no means a measurer, as in, you know, scientifically measure these things. It's, it's about 30%-ish, thereabouts. I mean, if I was measuring it, if it was getting too scientific on it, I'm going to start to suck the joy out of doing this. It becomes a little bit, a little bit too serious for me, you know what I mean? And if this is the... The King of the North that I'm doing here. I don't know how many, how many seeds have I got here? There's two, two right next to each other. Let's just split them up a little bit. So we've got one, two, three, four. Oh, we've got about 10 in there. Sprinkle on top, just a, a cover in there. You know, there's maybe about a centimetre on top there for them as well. Scoosh that down. When I take them into the house, I will water them in the house. I don't keep the water to the watering bottle. You normally see the good old, the famous iron brew bottle that you see down here. In the winter at the moment, when it's freezing cold overnight, I keep it up there in the house because obviously when you're watering, you don't want to be squishing freezing cold water on your newly newly sown seeds or your little plants or anything like that. Don't want to fire that on because it's not going to do them any good whatsoever. And I'm just I'm just making sure I've got my little my little label there. I am terrible at labelling. That could be maybe it's a bit of my New Year's resolution. Get things labelled properly all the time. So we'll pop them over there. So I was mentioning right at the very start of the video there about a bit of a bit of myth busting on, on food miles. And JB from the Naturally JB channel shared a, an interesting link the other day. And it was a link it took me off to Twitter, and I think it was a it was a Channel 4 interview. And it was a, a Scottish lady who was getting interviewed, she's a sort of agricultural scientist, and she was talking about food miles. Now, those of you who've been around my cha channel for a while. I know one of the reasons I started my allotment was because I was, I was watching something on TV one night years ago and they were talking about food miles and then there's this, like, this little, little light went up from my head and I was like, I should get an allotment and that'll help with food miles. It's exactly what I should do. Off I jolly well went, got an allotment and have never looked back since. By the way, next seeds, we're doing the, the sweet tangerine dream at the moment. Pretty much the same technique as doing the king of the north. But... She was she was talking about food miles and the the data, and I'm a big fan of data. The data that, that they look at in terms of them being scientists doesn't always measure up. That sort of eating locally and, and buying local produce is the best thing to do. And I was quite surprised when I started watching it. A lot of the messaging that you see is all about buying local and eating local. And she she went on to explain quite quite well I must admit and she said you know not that they not that they showed the data on it she was saying that the data backs up that due to some of the way some things are farmed let's let's take beef for example so you hear about locally produced beef but she was saying about the the machinery that's involved in agriculture the chemicals that are used the feed that's used and she mentioned cows burping in particular now I've heard about cows farting before, but I've never heard cows burping before as being this sort of, you know, they, they release a lot of methane, don't they, into the atmosphere. And she was saying about that, that that 
often the, the CO2, the carbon footprint, whatever you want to call it, that, that's emitted by that process of you getting that meat from somewhere locally, the, the sort of intensive farming purposes or processes, I should say, in and about producing that particular sort of beef burger or steak or whatever you have, in, produces way more carbon than, say, your avocado that's grown in South America, shipped thousands of miles, packaged somewhere, and then shipped to the supermarket. Because I... I must admit myself, I always think that the amount of fuel that's used for shipping these products around the world before it gets to you, wherever you buy it from, the supermarket or wherever, and you take it home, put it in your fridge, whatever, is a big issue. It's a big problem, and it is a big problem. It is a big issue. But, you know, albeit anecdotally, I've heard recently, or, or in recent years, about this whole eating local thing. It was just, it was quite interesting to, to hear. And I, and I guess this maybe is a bit of a... For me, what, what the takeaway for me was... And by the way, we're just we're just doing the coal rally, the Cossack F one here. While I'm while I'm having a bit of a, a, a witter on, I guess the, the the takeaway for me on that one is finding a balance. And I guess it's a balance between something that's locally produced. So you you're removing the the food miles sort of out of the equation, or as, or as best you can. You know, nothing's ever going to be completely carbon neutral. I wouldn't have thought. And you know, ethical, sustainable farming practices that aren't using really intensive practices, loads of machinery, loads of fuel, loads of chemicals, that sort of stuff. It's one of the things that I try to do on the allotment. Obviously, I'm at a, at a much, much, much smaller scale in, in terms of using chemicals. I don't like to use weed killer. I don't like to use insecticides, nothing like that. I try to keep it completely organic. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, it drives me around that twist with the slugs and the snails and the butterflies, and the whatever else you've got to try and protect yourself against. And it would be so easy just to whoosh, get the old insecticide out, just cover it all. And it's all protected, it's all fine, but it's not what I want to do. And again, one of the things they were talking about, and let me, let me just interject here while I'm having a bit, of a, a bit of a chat. We've got some all the year round cauliflower. Let me show you that here. I didn't show you this at the start. And these need potting on because they're getting a bit big. They've got their true leaves on them now, so I'm okay to sort of start potting them on. So that's what I'm going to be pottering, pottering away here with while we're, while we're having a bit of a, a bit of a chat about, about this sort of whole farming thing and that. And again, when they were talking about animals mainly, but when you think about the production of sort of vegetables and, and, and crops in, in agriculture, and that's the, the chemicals again that they're using there. I was just talking about the the insecticides or the, the fertilizers or whatever they're doing. And it's the runoff from it. So obviously when it rains, you know, all this all this stuff, as soon as the farmer applies it, all this stuff doesn't magically, you know, stick to the plants or just go straight into the plants and never be seen again. Obviously when it rains, when it gets watered, whatever, there's runoff and it runs off into our streams, our lakes, our locks, our rivers. And all that sort of stuff and causes problems for the environment further down the line. And I guess it's, it's just, I, I don't even know, I, you know, I'm just having a bit of a, a bit of a chat about this. I don't have any sort of solution or anything to it because obviously it's, what they're doing as well when they're using these sort of intensive processes and the, the, the sort of chemicals that they're using and in the way that they're producing stuff is probably quite cost effective. And I think at the moment, you know, when we're sort of right in the middle of a of a cost of living crisis, and we live in a country where, you know, some people can't afford to eat. People have to go to food banks. And if you change the processes that the farmers are using, I mean, people people can't afford to go and buy this stuff from the supermarket using the cheap processes at the moment that it is to produce some of this food. How do you, what, what do you do about that? How do you, how do you fix that? How do you make that better without massively increasing taxes council taxes income taxes any sort of taxes how do you do that i don't know i'm not a politician i don't i don't have the solution but it's just just when we were we were talking through just chatting through some of this there while i'm while i'm sorting out the the little cauliflowers here just some of the some of the things that's coming into my my head about this when you think it through because you know sometimes I think these days, I don't think we, you know, we don't stop and think about things. Everything's, everybody's always in a hurry, aren't we? We're always going somewhere and doing something. And I guess, <laughs> thinking about it again, thinking about all sorts of stuff here. 
when we're, we're talking about the allotment and food miles and production techniques and that, there's so much more to it than just just that, than just growing your own food, you know. It's, it's the opportunity when we're all busy during the week, if you're at work or whatever it is you're doing, rushing around, doing this, that, and the other. Sometimes it's just a bit of an opportunity to slow down a little bit, isn't it? You know, you get your, get your hands in the soil, get your hands in the mud, slow down, get in touch with the earth, sow some seeds. I mean, sowing a seed and bringing it on into a little plant like we're doing now. You know, we've got the little cauliflowers here. That was just a bunch of seeds that I chucked in some compost. And they're little plants now. And, I w- <laughs> well, I would say in a few a few months we might have some cauliflowers, but I don't know, if you you know how difficult it is to, to grow cauliflowers in, in my track record with some things sometimes that it doesn't always work out that way. But we'll, we'll see. But again, for you, you know, that, that sort of slowing down in your, in your mental health and the, just the, the benefits that the... That any sort of gardening or allotmenteering or I guess just any sort of outdoor activity that anybody does that it brings has a massive, massive benefit. So there's there's a huge balance to be had here between, you know, these sorts of productivity things, the way we produce things and the other benefits that it brings about your own your own health, whether you've had medical problems, whether you've had mental health problems, anything like that. I'm a big advocate that being in the garden, whether you think, like I say before, whether you think gardens and flowers or allotments and flowers or vegetables or fruit or whatever it is that, that tickles your fancy, just giving yourself a bit of time, slowing down, getting out there, getting on with it. even even now, just planting on these these little cauliflowers. It's quite it's quite therapeutic. I've been at work, I've been at work. I got in the office at half six this morning. I left the house at six o'clock, freezing cold. You know, six o'clock st- stood outside scraping the car in minus five degrees it was rotten it was awful driving down the motorway getting into work and i've done you know i've done nearly a full day there come back and i'm just taking an hour so we get a wet something called a well-being hour at work which is which is absolutely brilliant a sort of hour a week that we can do things with and my thing for my well-being is just to come in here and do a bit of pottering about with some stuff but anyway on the end of that, let, let me just sort of summarise where we are with things. So, we've got our Tangerine Dream Sweet Peppers. We've got our King of the North Sweet Peppers. And we've got our Cossack F1 Kohlrabis, all done in the same way. Now, the two lots of sweet peppers are going to go in the heated propagator. They'll need heat to propagate to get them going. They'll go into the grow lights. They're going to be inside for quite a while. The Cossack F1, the Kohlrabis... They'll go in the house, they won't go in the heated propagator, so they'll just get the natural heat that's in the house. They'll germinate, once they germinate, once they come in a little bit, they'll come out here to the unheated greenhouse. And hopefully, in a few weeks' time, again, some of these really hard, nasty frosts we're having at the moment, once we're into March, hopefully they just sort of die down just a, just a little bit. And last but not least, we managed to squeeze in a little bit of time to put on these lovely little cauliflowers. These are all the round ones. They've been in that little seed tray fridge. I probably should have done this about two weeks ago. But they're in. They're done. They'll get watered. They're sorted. Anyway, that's me done for today. Thank you for watching. And hopefully I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now, folks.